as Justin said, I work at Lang O'Rourke in research and development. Um, I've been on the Aroka project since last year, and my background uh, in previous jobs was working on quality improvement, for, particularly on visual inspection, dimensional measurements, etc., which is, which is how I've uh, ended up where we are today. Um, Mariana will introduce herself when she uh, kicks in to, for her section part way through. We're going to look at what we do today in terms of visual inspection. Uh, Mariana will introduce the Trimble Augmented Reality Technologies. Uh, I'll take you, well, both of us will take you through the results from the two demonstrators. and We'll talk about what we've learned from doing it and where we see the next steps for these technologies in this area. So what we do today, um, the typical workflow involves paper drawings or e-paper, so those are PDFs on a mobile device, sometimes 3D models as well. Um, there's pre-inspection tasks. So before, back in the office, someone, an engineer or the inspector, has to mark up a drawing or model with dimensions that need to be checked. Um, once out in the field, you're doing things uh, for measurement, with dimensional measurement, you're actually me measuring the physical things and recording the value either on the drawing or elsewhere. If it's a visual inspection task, in principle, you're comparing what you see on paper to what's physically there, the as-built. And to do that, you need to locate yourself. Um, you're checking for the presence of the correct objects and there's nothing missing, nothing extra. Um, you're also confirming of those objects when it's around rebar cages, um, are things in the correct location and in the correct orientation. Um, during and after inspection, you are recording results. So you're, you could be marking up a drawing or model. You could be entering values into a mobile device, which could be okay. Yes, it's what, you know, what I see is what's there or not good and the reasons and the issues. You could be recording value, uh, values and so numbers, dimensions, comments, whatever. Could also be images, all sorts of things that could be captured. And at some point, particularly when it's, we're talking about nuclear construction, uh, as we are here, it's transferring some of that data into the permanent as-built records, both quality and physically what the as-built is. There's also the need sometimes to branch out and collaborate with colleagues if you um, identify a quality concern during the inspection, at which point you need to record some data, take photos or videos, and usually have to go back to the office and have a meeting. Sometimes you can do it in the field with sort of, you know, teams on your mobile phone, but it's generally you end up going back somewhere. So stopping what you're doing or wait till the end, go back and, and have that discussion. So the way I've approached this based upon my, because my background was in um, nuclear vessels and fuel manufacture and, and aerospace, we use a tool called process failure modes effects analysis. So that's the view of the world we have. On any inspection operation, there are two generic standard failure modes, passing a bad product, rejecting a good product. I and mean, we're probably all familiar with these concepts now when we talk about COVID tests, because essentially that's the two things. The first one, passing a bad product called a type one error, is the most serious um, because it says further down the slide, it could at the best, you're talking late discovery, which means rework and time delay. Worst case, you're talking latent defects, customer complaints, etc. So that, that's the inspection failure mode. So production defects that we're trying to detect with, this, with an inspection operation are having the wrong type of parts, the quantities are wrong, so too many, too few things are in the wrong location or things are in, installed in the wrong orientation. And go down to the bottom block, potential causes of those inspection failure modes are missing an object in the real world. So if I check from drawing to real, I might not notice there's an extra object being added there. I can also no, um, miss an object on a, my drawing or model, either because you know, I, I'm, I just make a mistake or uh, I'm not able to record my progress as I go through. Uh, counting errors and the way counting comes in, particularly with rebar inspection, if you look at that model on the left, on the right, sorry, you, you're not just counting the quantity of bars, you're using the ind you're indexing in a grid along by counting from one side. So again, you can make counting errors. If I were expecting to see a plate in the sixth gap, you've got to count along six gaps. Uh, inspector fatigue. Um, and it's also the inspector has to work methodically one object at a time, which is, I'll say, it can be an issue. Oh. 
Hello, can you see my screen now? Is everything okay? Yep. Perfect. So, hi from my side too. As uh, James said, my name is Mariana Kopsida and I work for Trimble. And uh, along with uh, my Trimble colleagues, um, Ted and Steve, and also our Langorurk and Bylor colleagues, Scott, James, Jack, and Julien, that you can uh, see here uh, as a very happy person. Uh, we try to explore within the Aeropka project uh, if and how augmented reality can improve the way we conduct construction inspection. So basically what uh, uh, we have been doing was to test different systems uh, and their corresponding workflows and also uh, implement those in different uh, use case scenarios in order to better identify um, um, how the technology can be used, um, the, the benefits, uh, some of the challenges, and see where we can improve in the future. So first, uh, I would like to take you through those uh, uh, different terms that we keep uh, uh, using, augmented reality, mixed reality, what is what. So virtual reality is basically when we replace our uh, environment with a totally digital, digital content. So as you can see uh, in the image on the left, uh, somebody uh, uh, wears some goggles and uh, the user emerges in a totally digital environment. He's only able to interact with it. On the other hand, with uh, augmented reality, uh, what we achieve is basically to enhance a real environment with some digital context that uh, we might need for the tasks uh, that we are performing. And uh, mixed reality is when we merge uh, the digital and the physical environment into one and the user is able to interact with uh, both environments simultaneously. So within the Europka project, uh, we test the, uh, those uh, systems that you see in your screen. Uh, the Trimble Side Vision systems and the Trimble XR10 and HoloLens 2 device with the Trimble Connect for HoloLens application. The Trimble XR10 is a mixed reality head mounted display. Uh, uh, basically, it consists of Microsoft HoloLens 2 components and there is a hard hard integration in order to enable mixed reality workflows um, where the PPEs are, are required in a such environment. As you can see uh, on the photo on your right, uh, it's a totally hands-free device. So in order to interact with the data, we use your, our fingers. Compared to the HoloLens One device, uh, we have a wider uh, field of view, and there is also support for eye tracking, longer uh, battery life, and in general, it's a much more powerful and more accurate device. <clears throat> um, the Trimble Connect for HoloLens application is basically the mixed reality application um, that uh, is used on uh, XR10 or HoloLens 2 device and allows the user to take the 3D data in the field and interact with it. There are various ways that the user can um, uh, align the data in the field, uh, for example, either by using surfaces or uh, by using QR codes. And in the Aeropka project, we, we utilize the QR codes as uh, James will show uh, in his examples. Uh, the application supports uh, multiple file formats and the user can load multiple models in the fields. Uh, he can unhide or hide different layers. And the way to interact with the data in the field can vary. So we can uh, capture to-dos, which is a way of reporting in the field. Um, we can also uh, have the ability to apply model sequence, uh, which uh, is quite handy for fabrication and scheduling. Uh, additional things that the user can do is, of course, to interrogate the data. So uh, check all the attributes that uh, is contained in the 3D model and take measurements like real-to-real, uh, model-to-model, or real-to-model, which can be uh, quite handy for inspection. Uh, the HoloLens device as a technology is designed for mainly indoor use. So Trimble Site Vision, um, is something different. A triple side vision is basically a high accuracy outdoors visualization tool for spatial data. 
And we say it's outdoors because uh, it integrates Genesis data with camera tracking data in order to support an augmented reality-based visualization of the 3D spatial data. <clears throat> and this is uh, what it makes it quite accurate and more stable than common mobile-based augmented reality applications that rely mainly on the camera. The accuracy that the side vision uh, system supports, <clears throat> excuse me, it's an RTK accuracy. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So the, <clears throat> the accuracy that we can achieve, it's two to three centimeters. There are different ways to align the data <clears throat> to the physical environment. If data is already uh, properly georeferenced, the device will place this data automatically at the right position in the field. However, if uh, uh, the data is not georeferenced, then the user has the ability to use the measured, as we call it, placement, where the user picks two points in the model and the corresponding points in the physical environment, uh, utilizing the user interface of the application. And then uh, the 3D data uh, can be properly aligned uh, in, in the field. There are two different uh, triple side visions, uh, side vision systems. Uh, one is the handheld device and it consists of the following components. The first one is uh, that uh, uh, EDM enabled handheld bracket. It's a battery power bracket that connects the catalyst antenna on the top uh, and the electronic distance, me distance measurement and uh, the mounted uh, Android based phone. So the Trimble Catalyst antenna, it's basically a USB power Genesis antenna and positioning service. Uh, and it allows high quality Genesis signal and satellite corrections to be passed to the Catalyst engine running on the Android device. Then by utilizing uh, um, an Android based phone, we can uh, run the Side Vision app, which basically leverages the power of uh, the Google AR Core. This is the library that it, you, it it is utilized for uh, the camera tracking and the triple positioning technology in order to be able to visualize uh, the 3D spatial data in a high accurate way. The other triple side vision uh, uh, is based uh, on, a, on the traditional survey kit and more specifically on an R12i Genesis um, sensor and the TSC7 data logger. Uh, that you can see on the right on the right uh, hand side in the photos. As you can imagine, because we are using in this case uh, more traditional survey equipment, we can operate in more challenging environments, either in terms of temperature, but also in terms of uh, um, GNSS challenging environments. The engine of this Genesis antenna is much more powerful. So the uh, initialization is uh, actually faster. Another benefit uh, of using this, uh, this system is the fact that we don't rely so much on the camera tracking, but we also fuse IMU data. And that allows us to work as well at night since we don't rely on camera features. Uh, and also the orientation remains more stable. And that can be quite useful in um, inspection tasks because the user might need to, to uh, stay quite static for some time, so it won't lose uh, um, orientation. <clears throat> um, another benefit or another difference is the fact that uh, uh, with that system we can operate in areas with no cell coverage or actually use a local base. In general, those two side vision systems um, have the, exactly the same functionalities in terms of the application. But as you can imagine, it's a little bit uh, a trickier to, to walk around uh, with uh, that kit since it's heavier compared to the handheld one. The workflow that those uh, uh, systems support uh, is the following, and as you can see here. So basically, we, we can have the data from the office in the Aeropka project, we mainly used IFC models, and that is uploaded to Trimble Connect. In the previous session, in part one, uh, we extensively described how Trimble Connect has been used um, uh, in Aeropka project. So I encourage you to, to watch that part as well if you haven't done so. 
and then somebody that is in the field uh, can utilize those devices in order to visualize the data by just launching the application and data from Trimble Connect will be uploaded there. The data will be aligned in the environment with the various ways that we will describe later on. We can also interact with it and data capture from these devices in the field can be saved directly back to Trimble Connect. So we kind of enhance this kind of real time communication between the office and the field since somebody from the office can also have uh, instant access to this data that is saved back to the Trimble Connect platform. Uh, once data has been loaded in this device, with that video, we will show you uh, some functionalities that the uh, Trimble Side Vision systems support and that have been also utilized in the Aeropka project. As you can see here, the augmented reality technology, it's quite handy because we can see the data in the 3D environment from different perspectives. There is also the ability to view the data in 2D and we know where we stand relative to our 3D data. And the other advantage is the fact that we can also have access to all the properties. So it's not just 3D geometry. We, the data also contains all the attribute data. We can also take uh, measurements, real to real, model to model, real to model. Uh, and this information can be saved back to the office as a CSV file as well. The different mode measurements uh, are, as you see here, GNSS, the real with the EDM, and the AR is basically measurements that we take within the 3D data. In the field, we can also create and assign to-do tasks. So we capture this mixed reality photo, we assign a specific date, a specific uh, type, and we send it to a specific uh, person, and that person instantly gets an email uh, in, the, in, the, in the office that something has happened in the field so they can review this data. We can section the model to review classes or we can hide on high layers, which helps with uh, the data handling in, uh, in the field. We can view uh, combined models. And similarly, we can check uh, uh, all the components uh, that sits and the details that sits within the, the 3D data. Here is uh, uh, some examples of uh, how augmented reality can be used or has been used uh, for construction inspection. Here you, you can see how the data can be aligned in the field so we can check if something has been built correctly at the right location, within the right shape, or we can also see what's coming next. Here we can see or we can utilize this in order to check if what we have already done uh, is okay for what is coming uh, what is coming next or we can just uh, check the progress of, of our project or communicate with other stakeholders uh, with regards to to the project and what is going on and again we can check if the design data is correct or if uh, the project is going according to plan In a similar way, when we are in an indoor environment, uh, as we saw before, we can utilize uh, the Trimble Connect for Holland's application. Here in this example, you can see how uh, we can uh, utilize again, multiple data. In this case, a 3D DWG for annotations, along with the Tecla model. So again, we can check all the details. We can see if uh, um, what we have built is according to the design data and communicate with other stakeholders uh, um, with regards to, to the prog progress. So this was uh, an introduction to the technology and the capabilities. Now we will see how we have uh, implemented this within the Europa uh, project and, and some of the outcomes that we came across with. So the first thing that we did was actually to to take these systems and check, uh, uh, check them in the real environment. The first visit at the uh, Hinkley Point C was, I would say, 
exploratory, basically, uh, because what we wanted to achieve is for us to understand the challenges of the environment and the workflows that the people are using there, uh, but also for the people at Bylor and that they are working there uh, to, to understand the technology and, and how and think about ways of how it can be used. However, uh, two very important lessons uh, uh, were learned on that day. First of all, uh, as you can see on the images below, the data that we had to handle uh, uh, were very dense. So it was quite tricky to, to utilize this data for inspection purposes and see if everything is right or the right location. So it was quite obvious from the, uh, from the beginning that we will need to incorporate in the workflows a way to add different kinds of annotations or different layering in the models in order to utilize those in an appropriate way in the field. Uh, the second outcome uh, was the fact that um, it was quite challenging to align the model there uh, in the physical uh, river cage, as you can see here. Um, the reason for that is those, those river cages are not built in a specific place. Basically, they're built wherever they have space for. Um, so the data is not georeferenced. Um, so we had to pick with the points, but uh, through the uh, user interface and because of the complicated way this, uh, uh, these models were designed or they are, it was quite difficult or challenging to uh, uh, have an accurate alignment in the field. So in the second visit that uh, uh, we did, we were more targeted in the use cases that we explored. So the first one uh, that we explored was uh, how we can utilize the augmented reality and the side vision system in order to check the shape of the rivers. You can see in this scenario that uh, uh, the value or the benefits are quite obvious because if we align the model in the, uh, in the right location, then it's quite easy and straightforward to see uh, if the, the, the shape of this river is correct or not. And in addition to this, we have uh, the, the ability to take measurements or capture this to do, and somebody in the office can uh, have this notification that something is, is wrong from the field. Um, the different use case that we explored was in, in a more proper river cages, let's say. And again, you can see how the technology can be used in order to check as visual inspection uh, if we have the right amount of rebirths or if the rebirths are at the right location, if we are missing something and all these things. And then we try to check in something more complicated um, in the previous cases, the alignment that was used was the measure placement, uh, but in this uh, scenario, it was um, quite challenging to do that. Maybe if we had at that point the R12i system, we will, uh, it will be easier for the user to, to pick the right points, especially uh, in the real environment, but at, at that point we didn't have that system. So what we did was a proper survey. We had. Uh, this external uh, total session with us, and we uh, uh, gather some data, we measure some coordinates, and uh, we also uh, uh, use the 3D scanning capability to scan the data. So we went back in the office, and in the office software, uh, we aligned the, the data, the 3D model, correctly using the data from the field. And then we use the automated measure, uh, placement and the result uh, can be uh, displayed here in the video. So you can see again uh, the ability to have the 3D data aligned um, in the real environment and how this can be used uh, for inspection purposes. And here it's uh, from a different perspective too. From that uh, visit, the main uh, outcome was the fact that um, the technology um, is not quite there because, as we mentioned, is uh, we we can achieve two to three centimeters accuracy, but the requirement at Hinkley for accuracy for inspection was less than half centimeter. Uh, so, uh, in order to accommodate and address this challenge, we we try to explore a different way of uh, of utilizing augmented reality. 
and this point, uh, we also released a new version of the Trimble Axis, which supports uh, uh, 3D design models in the field. So basically, we explored how the SX10, which is a total station, basically it's a hybrid of total station with a, a, a laser scanner, how it can be utilized uh, with the Trimble Access over in the field. Um, the corresponding workflow is, as you can see here, first we have to do some pre-process of the data, let's say, at the office. So we require to georeference the models. And, and then we can also create uh, setting out points either from the uh, design software or from another software or that's only in case the, the, the user requires to have this kind of data. And then this data is pushed to the data logger. Once we are in the field, we run the traditional uh, resection process to establish the total station and then the data will sit at the right location. Once we use the data and we perform the tasks that we need in the field, we can uh, use different styles for reporting and this data can go back to, to the office. So in this slide, I'm focusing a little bit more on how uh, the user can interact with the data in the field. There are two different ways of uh, viewing the data. One is by utilizing the 3D model view or we can uh, also view the models in an augmented reality-based environment. Again, we can have multiple models, we can access attributes, um, uh, we can hide and hide layers depending on the needs of the, of, uh, of, uh, the user. Uh, another benefit that we have is the fact that we can also create set out points directly from the design data in the field in case we have missed some setting out data in the office. And uh, then we can conduct verification and we can check points, we can check surfaces, or uh, uh, we can even check verticality. And the accuracy in, in that case is millimeter because we're using a total station for this verification. It can go more accurate than this. Then we can create, the, as I mentioned before, some customi customizable uh, reports that can be fed uh, back to the office. Unfortunately, uh, due to COVID travel restrictions, we weren't able to, to test this more thoroughly on site. However, uh, James uh, continued with some of his testings with, uh, side vision, uh, with the side vision systems and the HoloLens device. And he will talk more about this in the next few slides. James, I'm handing it over to you. Thanks. Right, okay, thank you, Mariana. So carry on, pick up where, um, on the two demonstrators we did. So we did two site demonstrators, um, and as, as Mariana just said, we couldn't get on to Hinkley at the time because of COVID. So we did one round of trials with Site Vision, um, at a site in Derbyshire, um, and another round of trials with uh, HoloLens indoors at the MRC 2050 um, early this year. So what we were looking for on both technologies, both outdoor sight vision and indoor uh, HoloLens is testing the workflow for inspection, assessing them how good they are at visualization, how good they are at actually doing the core visual inspection task, what they're able to do around dimensional measurement and quantify the capability, um, but also and generally assess their usability, reliabilities of the devices. Basically, are they production ready? So the Derbyshire site, um, shown up on the top right picture, um, it's, it's a farm. It's actually my farm because I live on a farm. Um, it's, so I modelled three structures in, in CAD, um, a green rectangle on the right, a red oblong at the back, which is um, a barn and a pole barn in grey on the left. Perfectly adequate uh, for what we needed to do uh, for, uh, to assess all of the, bar, uh, the above. Um, so one of the things I did on the measurement was a repeatability study to assess the measurement capability, which I'll talk on a subsequent slide. Uh, I also assessed how quickly the, the equipment set up and how often it needed resetting, if indeed it did. Oops. Um, trials I did a demonstrator three at the AMRC, 
Uh, we used the same rebar cage as was used uh, described yesterday for the artificial intelligence in, um, inspection tool at our workshop factory. Um, the reason we used it was because the cage was there and we had um, IFC models of it. So we did a visual inspection trial and assessed its, its ease of use. And we'll come on to the details of that in a bit. So on, um, on the Derbyshire trial, um, testing the workflow down the bottom. So uploaded model onto Trimble Connect, which is shown on that, on that middle image. Uh, so that's off my laptop PC. Um, that was a model I uploaded to it. Um, the side vision device then locates itself and it varies between the two as Marianne has already described. Load and locate the model, so um, align the virtual to the physical, uh, perform the inspection and then capture um, a concern or issues or data to review later back through the uh, Trimble Connect cloud. Uh, uploading to Trimble Connect was quick and intuitive. Um, the devices took about two minutes to set themselves up. Um, so because it's based upon satellite signals, GNSS, it's from switch on, it's, they take about two minutes to get a good enough signal, find enough satellites, uh, trilaterate their location, and then to get orientation, they have to establish it by, on the, on the handheld device, for instance, you move between two points, and, that, um, and then the device visually looks at what it's seeing, and that it works out, therefore, its, its orientation, which obviously it needs to correctly position thing. Uh, we captured a, a to-do, as Marianne described, and we'll see more of those later. And I was able to view it on Trimble Connect, back, at, back at, um, on my laptop at my desk. Uh, for visualisation, we've seen it on Hinkley Point C already and at Derbyshire, very easy. Does exactly what you'd expect it to do. Uh, image stability, I did have some stability issues, um, which we um, Trimble have said they have other customers not experienced. So we think it might be down to how accurately I modelled and located these because I didn't do it tremendously accurately, deliberately, because I wanted errors. Because I'm going to measure discrepancies, I actually need error in the first place. So we think that might have actually confused the technology slightly. So I think we'll let it off on that one. I think it's down to me. Uh, visual inspection, I was already shown this picture using sight vision, very quick, very easy to show an obvious discrepancy. Uh, for dimensional measurements, um, assessed it use, uh, its repeatability. Now, you can't really assess accuracy because I'd have to assess its GNSS location against something more accurate. So what instead, repeatability is how consistent is the, uh, are the measurements I take with it? Because the ideal measurement device, I get the same result every time. Um, and we then compare it from that, work out what, what drawing or model tolerance can I actually measure. We did something called a type one gauge study, which is on the next slide. Usability, reliability. Um, the handheld device uses the, the camera view to calculate orientation. It uses basically Google Play IR services. And it did periodically need the orientation resetting. Um, it's, it was weather and environment um, dependent. Um, days when it was sort of fairly cloudy, no direct sunlight, it worked pretty well and pretty um, stably. On one day, it was clear skies, very low sun coming into about quarter to four in the evening with sunset being about half four. Uh, and the rays of sun coming through were very nearly the same angle as uh, the fence line of that green block. So the device was getting quite confused as was it looking at the sun, sunlight or was it looking at the fence line? Um, the R12 device, um, surveying standard one, never needed orientation or resetting at all. Once it was, once you set it up, once you were going, that was it, it was fine. Um, never needed anything at all, so um, much more stable, much more usable. Uh, loading a model to the both devices, very easy. The model, um, Ted helped me out here and geolocated it for me. Again, you just pull it in, it already knows where, the device already knows where it is, plonk, puts the model in the right place. I did try out the manual location, was a little bit fiddly, but it worked. A lot of the fiddliness comes down into you using a touch screen, particularly on the handheld device. Uh, you know, you're using a, fid a fiddly touch screen outdoors, usually raining at the same time because I'm doing it in December, um, trying to accurately position something by sliding your finger around. So, but we got there, in, you know, I got there. It's just a little bit difficult to use places. Right, repeatability as I measured with both sight vision devices. The question we're trying to ask is, okay, we didn't set out the project to, to do dimensional measurement with these devices. However, Sight Vision has a dimensional measurement capability. So it's saying, well, okay, I've got the kit here. 
the question is, is it possible to dimensionally re measure rebar? So that's between the CAD virtual, the nominal design to the as-built physical location using these devices. Um, so, so you see on the image on the, the side there, in that example, where it says code EDM to AR, the left-hand sphere, the center of that sphere is a point I've zapped with the EDM on the handheld device. So a corner of that fence. And um, the other sphere it, it, um, is used on using AR, so augmented reality, is I've interactively with the crosshairs selected uh, the corner of those three faces on the object. So by measuring to the, between the two, same two points multiple times, um, if I get the same or very close result each time, that means my repeatability is very good, and therefore I can calculate uh, the tolerant, feet the drawing tolerance I can measure with it. So we did it with both devices. I actually assessed it in two ways. Firstly, I did the single point, so measuring the absolute latitude, longitude, location, or actually I did it in a type of thing, I actually did it in OS, um, OS units of a single point using satellites, EDM, the laser, and augmented reality. Um, and I then did what I was actually trying to understand, real to CAD. And the reason for doing the single point first is, if I get a result I'm not happy with at the second stage, I want to understand my components of variation. You know, if I get um, a certain result from real to CAD, I want to know, is it being driven by the satellites? Is it being driven by the laser? Or is it being driven by the AR? Which of the underlying me single measurements is actually driving the variation. So the equation we use for a type one study is the feature tolerance I'm capable of measuring. So the width of a tolerance band is a factor called CG, which is gauge capability, which is a magic number of 1.33. It's one of those, you just use the number. N number of standard deviations, well it's six, because six standard deviations in a normal distribution. On the bottom line, P is what proportion of the tolerance am I happy for my measurement system to use up? So normally in metrology, we look at 10%. So when I was back in aerospace and nuclear fuel manufacture, high, high importance features, we'd be very, very strict on it and say, the, uh, the measurement uh, system must not consume more than 10% of the drawing tolerance. However, on less important features, we'd relax it to 20. So I thought, I'll be generous here, I'll make P 20%. Um, the final factor, sigma, is the thing I actually go and measure. So I, by taking repeated measurements, and you can see in the top right box where it says calculated distance, 0.12 meters, when you actually go through Trimble Connect, you get a lot more detailed number, you know, a lot more precise number, is I, having done multiple measurements to get a standard deviation, so 50 I was usually doing, 50, I calculate my standard deviation of sigma, and it's those other factors multiply out to, well, it's actually 39.9, but let's, let's, let's round it up and call it 40. So the results I got were on the handheld device, the first line, so measuring satellite for the physical point uh, on the physical object, AR on the, um, on the virtual object. My standard deviation was just over eight millimeters. Well, unfortunately, multiply by 40, that means I can only measure three, a tolerance width 325, so plus minus, what's that, 107 or whatever, uh, 112. Um, with a Windows device, actually came out slightly worse, which I was a little surprised at, 9.5, 380, but they're in the same ballpark. And if I'd done, I did actually do the assessment several times on different days, and the results would go up and down, but you know, I sort of picked some ones in the middle. So, you know, broadly, that's the tolerance I'm taking and people are measuring. And as Mariana said, for nuclear rebar, we're talking five, 10 millimeter sort of tolerance. You know, we're, we're not in, we're not clearly not in the same ballpark for measuring that. So absolutely, you know, unfortunately, it would have been a nice to have, but unfortunately it's, you know, with GNSS is not precise enough to do it. Some of the variation actually comes from the software and the devices, which could actually be re uh, reduced is around the camera calibration. Um, so because like we take that bottom right image, I've got to align where the laser shoots to where the camera on the mobile phone sees it. That is a, is a manual alignment with me jogging the crosshairs around until as I'm stood there holding, a, holding it with a laser shone on something, I get the two lining up. You know, that could be automated. Uh, virtual object selection. So we see that top right image, 
you see the crosshair has gone slightly inside. Um, there's no snap to function that I can just say, snap to the corner, please, or snap to the edge, or snap to the centre line, which is, you know what, if I'm measuring things like rebars, I generally want a front centre line or an outer edge or something like that, rather than just, where, where's my crosshairs line up, fat finger, take that point. Also, if you were going to, do, they were going to develop this, you'd start to need some basic construction tools as you get in proper measurements software like uh, Spatial Analyzer. If I've got an array of parallel bars, I actually want to construct lines that represent the center line, so two points per bar, and then the software says normal distance between them is this. Otherwise, if I just do two points, I'm detecting the distance between the bars plus how far up and down I did, which is like a factor I'm not actually interested in. So again, because you're sort of constructing geometry in space, you've got to take account of these. And again, it's not designed to do it, so therefore at the minute it doesn't do it. The hard stuff to actually go beyond this, to really eat into that feature tolerance and get it down, would you be looking at base stations? You know, it's satellites, you're never going to get that sort, you know, the, the satellite error it reports in the top left box there is in a few centimetres. You know, you'd have to be down into sing, two or three millimetres of your uh, of a location but you know there's things like 5g base stations out there that could actually be usable in certain conditions right so moving on to demonstrator three so this is the indoor with uh, the hollow lens now still inspecting rebar case so still doing the same task but it's the indoor version as i mentioned we used um the amrc's trial one that we we langer have given them one because it was there and two because we had the cajun concrete model it's not quite, I can't do an AR inspection if I don't have a, a CAD model of the thing as well. Now, we were going to do it with the Trimble XR HoloLens device, which is the helmet mounted one. However, because of COVID restrictions, we couldn't move people around to transport the device. So, we decided the easiest option was to use a standard HoloLens 2. But really, it's exactly the same, it's just not mounted on a hard hat. You know, the, 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 the features we were testing, the functionality I was looking at is, is completely unaffected for the trial. So all we had to do was just install Trimble Connect HoloLens software and set it up on, on a device at AMRC. So first thing, we tested the workflow again, similar to the last one, but very slightly different workflow. So the first box, uploading model to Trimble Connect, same as before, same as, exactly the same as before, very easy and intuitive. Getting it onto the HoloLens device, so that's using the interactive menus, floating menus that when I have it on, I see in front of me. We're, we're going to see a video in a couple of minutes that will show this. Um, course location using a Q, single QR code. One of the things we identified is it's very sensitive to orientation, particularly relative to the horizon. So fortunately, being stuck at home, I'm getting a lot of Amazon deliveries, so I cut the side of a cardboard box stuck my sheet of A4 paper to it and um, engineered some shims that means I could fine tune um, the horizon orientation of, of my QR code to do it more, to do it more precisely. Um, we captured a to-do, which we'll see on the video and then viewed it, and you'll see it on the video as well, it being viewed at the end. Um, we identified that the live collaboration functionality, it partly works but not in the way that I'd need it to work for visual inspection. Because for visual inspection, I, an inspector finds an issue, wants to collaborate with a colleague, a designer, an engineer, etc. I want to pause, jump straight out and bring them in. And it's one of the issues we found with the way that the cameras work on it with a remote user logged in. It doesn't work that way at the minute. I'll mention about that in a bit. So visualization, you'll see it on the video, extremely easy, very stable. You know, the images, once you position them there, that's it, they sit there. Very clear, very stable. It's advantage, of course, of doing it inside because my light conditions are more conducive. Uh, for visual inspection, and this is really the most important thing, the anomalies between virtual and physical were very easy, very quick to see. So I've uh, highlighted with some red boxes of the still picture on the side. You can see that lifting the bottom left is a lifting hook. It's out of position and 90 degrees rotated. Um, you know, I didn't set it up. This is how it was presented. Uh, we've got a couple of um, embankments uh, uh, plates in there that are slightly out of position. 
Um, I'd already done a very cursory paper or e-paper to physical inspection, and I picked up the, um, the brackets. I hadn't picked up that um, the embedded blocks were slightly out of position and some other issues. And um, bottom right, you can see a, wa uh, a wavy tail, and that was in the right position. I hadn't noticed it was 180 degrees rotated. It doesn't actually matter functionally, but you know it's wrong to drawing, and I hadn't seen that on e-paper. But I did. It's, it's blindingly obvious when I looked at a hollow lens. Um, the other, on the other side, though, it's very easy to be overwhelmed with information. Um, so I got quite attuned at turning layers on and off and having an inspection sequence. So big bars, small bars, lifting eyes, other embedments, and basically work through systematically and only have turned on the things I needed to see. Same like you can see the dimensions. If I'm not using them, turn them off. Otherwise, you, you can sort of visually overload yourself. Uh, for dimensional measurement, there is an issue with whether it's the HoloLens or the Trimble Connect software, I don't know, um, is selecting rebar is because if you, if you look at that model, actually most of that rebar model is fresh air and all those bars are cylinders. When I when you try and select something, you can see my, my tessellated hand on the bottom left and you, it's in selection mode, a ray of light shoots out of your finger that's visible to the visor. Even if I went right up to it, I could not get managed to select a, a bar. And if I can't select a bar, I can't do a, a CAD to CAD or CAD to real measurement. So unfortunately, we couldn't proceed with the dimensional measurement because I simply couldn't, couldn't take any. The selection works fine on big flat blocks, which we'll come, come to in a minute. Uh, fine location, other usability and reliability issues. Fine location is fiddly. Uh, again, it comes, a lot of it comes back to the object selection. You can see that green box is around a cube. The cube's got handles and little spheres on it. Uh, the handles, you translate the virtual object. The spheres, you rotate in a certain plane. The issue was that the handles are sticky. And often, of course, fine-tuning by its nature, I want to jog it a small amount. You jog it, it then sticks to your hand, and before you know it, you've actually thrown it 10 times further in the wrong direction than it was before. Um, also for tuning orientation, I need to look away because I want to look at the opposite end because that's where my error um, displacement, angular error is going to be expressed. And as soon as I look away, the device disconnects my hand from it. So I sort of developed a little loop of look at the error beforehand, pick the handle or the, um, the ball up, jog it and absolutely the least I could do, look at, whilst holding my hand still, look away with the headset which disconnected my hand so it didn't stick to it, look back and see, uh, see what the error has done. And, and a few goes of the cycles of that and you jog it into position. It, it's doable, but again, it's, it's, it's a bit clumsy. Um, a better method, if we were doing this in a fixed location, would actually be to have the QR code and multiple QR codes, probably three, to give an absolute or um, best fit location permanently mounted on a measurement fixture. So it's in a box at the minute, have them mounted outside of the box and have my CAD model, whether I'm doing in Tetra structures or whatever, has that, that box and QR code model. So basically I just have to locate my, my cage for inspection into my inspection fixture and the device then picks up off the fixture rather than off the product. But again, you know, if we were doing this regularly, we could do that ourselves. So it's, you know, that's something we completely do ourselves. Other points, as I said, general usability and stability need improvement. You know, we did have quite a few crashes and resets on it. Right, video time. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to log in to it using the QR code. Having positioned the model roughly using a QR code, we're now going to fine tune it to get it. There's a very small error in the QR code at that end throws the angle out and the position out at the far end. So if I bring up the menu, align, fine tune. So I attach this cube to this flat plate that I put there for this purpose. And you can see it needs to move that way. about for length and position. 
Now I need to check the rotation angle. That looks about right. Looking around and checking that all the rebar that the virtual model is showing is present and approximately in position. And the embedments, so some of them are slightly off, but this is only a demonstration model. So they're not accurately positioned, but it's demonstrating the principle. So I can see that all the things that are required are there. So you can, I can see the dimensions. Right, now I'm going to demonstrate, having done my inspection, I found something that I want to flag up, attach to the model, and for my, one of my colleagues to look at afterwards. So I'm going to do, create a to-do. So I go to menu, tools, to-do, create, attach it to this. Okay, this brings me up. I'm going to assign it there to a colleague. Let's attach an image. <coughs> Grabbed an image of it. Save to do. And I see here at the end that's having taken that to do. Later on, I looked at it back on my desktop and it saves the model location that I took the to do at. So straight away it jumps me to the CAD model to the same view. And I took a photograph of CAD to real. So, you know, for documenting an issue, uh, a quality concern, absolutely ideal. Okay, um, see that again. Um, so what we've learned from doing this and um, some next steps are in terms of its benefits, easier and much better quality of visual inspection. And if you improve the quality of visual inspection, you should lead to reduced likelihood of uh, quality defects escaping, customer complaints, etc. Uh, better as built evidence. So, as with any of those technologies, if I want to record evidence of as well as doing the inspections, I want to document as well as just record deviations. I've got my, my overlay of CAD nominal to real physical evidence is the fact that everything, if I want to go back to it and challenge it, I've got the evidence there that the inspection was done correctly. Um, different solutions for different requirements. So whether you're indoors, outdoors, and what accuracy level you are. But easy workflows, and they, you know, the workflows, they do what they're supposed to do. Um, better data interpretation and collaboration. Um, so, you know, it's definitely easy to see exactly what you're looking at, understand it, there's no misunderstanding. Um, we've shown user cases uh, for construction, particularly around, obviously, inspection of rebar. Uh, the challenges the technology has at the minute, uh, it's definitely not accurate enough for measuring CAD to real differences using outdoors using GNSS. Um, data registration when the data is not geo referenced. So, as Mariana mentioned, when they're at Hinkley, that they're in a rebar yard in a just in a place. So you've got to manually locate the models. And I found the same with the hollow lens. It's you know, you've got to position the things together if they are not geo referenced, and that, and those methods could be improved. Um, one of the things that would massively make this a lot easier, AR technology, is the quality and structure of the design models used and how they're annotated. 
So for example, that rebar one you just seen the video over, for me to turn individual things on to perform a proper inspection, there were probably eight to 10 layers in that model where actually if it was reduced to four layers geared towards the way that I was going to inspect it. So big bars, small bars, lifting hooks, etc., it would have been considerably easier. Um, so really that's the pushes back into when you go through your inspection planning task where you put your dimensions, your annotations on, you also need to uh, assign layers that are aligned to the way that the inspector is actually going to do the task, you know, the way they, they're going to sequence the inspection. If you think also, if you scale that up, you know, I was on a cage that's approximately two metres by one metre. You saw the size of some of the ones Mariana faced when she was at um, uh, Hinkley. There is no way you do that a whole cage like that in one go. You know, you'd section it off and you do all of the inspections in one location, particularly if you've got to access something at height. Um, you know, you do it in a zone and then you move on to the next zone. So again, that's some, another factor you bring, bring in on a larger device. Um, the technologies themselves, the devices, could better optimise how the information is presented. So I was manually changing layers, an obvious one with the hollow lenses, it's voice activated. You know, I was starting, I started that video recording by going, hey Katana, start video, and it starts recording. If you actually define the sequence of layers, back as I just described, you could actually index through it if there was a command that said next layer, or layer two, layer three, and you know, index forwards and backwards through it. So I don't have to go into the menus, I use the voice commands. Um, next steps beyond the obvious challenges, uh, enhancing the data, re um, data registration methods. So we mentioned about QR codes. Uh, reporting, enhancing reporting collaboration and co connectivity to other business systems. You know, if I'm raising a non-conformance, I'm going to go into work mobile or ERP or whatever. If I'm going to collect data that goes into the as-built records, I might need to go into my, uh, into my work pack or whatever. Um, really pushing the boundaries, you know, this is where we sat down and thought, what, where would you really want to go with this in a few years' time? Is we've already, for those of you who were on the uh, second session yesterday, AMRC showed us what they've been doing in our factory and workshop with artificial intelligence to, for image uh, inspection, uh, image interpretation for inspection. You could actually in, integrate that into the HoloLens software. So yes, the human does the inspection, but the software is drawing their attention to things. Hang on, this bit looks wrong. All of this stuff looks fine. This stuff's borderline. This stuff's definitely wrong. So again, they're, they're more guiding the inspector rather than just relying on the human. So enhancing the human's capabilities. Okay, and that's it. And I will hand back to Justin. Thank you, James. Okay, I'll share back to, here we go. So thanks very much. We've, had, we've got uh, quite a few questions um, and I think we'll just we'll sort of work through them uh, more or less in the order in which they came in, if that's okay. Um, so Adrian Shilliday asked about iOS capability. Um, Tor, do you want to introduce yourself if you're going to answer that one? Or is someone else answering that one? I, I can take it. Or oh, Mariana, right. yeah. So uh, for side vision, currently no, there is no support for iOS. It's only Android based or with the TS7 data logger, uh, it's Windows 10. Okay. Any any time frame or expectation uh, of going to iOS? Uh, there are different challenges in uh, integrating an iOS uh, um, uh, operating system because uh, as I described in the presentation we um, fuse the data that comes from AR core and that's purely a Google kind of library. Um, I suppose there are similar libraries in the iOS but we as probably the majority of people here know it's a little bit trickier more challenging to integrate iOS system uh, systems in d different systems like uh, like us. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a question about the major differences between the Trimble uh, AR device and the HoloLens 2, which I think Mariana, you, you answered, but do you, want, do you want to take that one for now? 
Yeah, sure. I, I have pointed that out uh, during my presentation too. Yeah. So, Holland is mainly designed for indoors <clears throat> and it's a mixed reality, <clears throat> excuse me, um, technology. Side vision is relying mainly on the Genesis data. So, it, it can be used mainly outdoors. <clears throat> but we can also see some common things that, uh, which are basically the Augmentation of our, our uh, environment with some um, some three D data, which can help with visual inspections. Both devices are kind of the one is wearable, the other one is handheld. But uh, both of them are easy to handle in the field and use. Uh, so I can I can see these things as well. Okay, thank you. Um, from David Robinson, uh, why do you use two point alignment on site? Surely three or four points alignment of actual site measurements to the CAD model would allow self correction of alignment and prediction of alignment of uncertainties. Yeah, David's point was uh, uh, spot on, to be honest, and this is how we can improve the alignment process. But uh, currently, the, the application is supporting the two points, and this is uh, why we use that. Okay, okay. Um, from Andrew Fitzpatrick, uh, what are the tolerances uh, of using the Trimble AR HoloLens for these rebar inspections? And again, the HoloLens uh, technology can support a couple of uh, centimeters accuracy, but it also relies a lot on the environment that the HoloLens is used. Uh, if it's a quiet and uh, feature, re uh, feature um, full environment, then it, it, the accuracy will be uh, much higher. Uh, but if there is quite a lot of noise or the environment doesn't have a lot of features to detect, then the accuracy will drop uh, quite a lot. So again, it, it varies. Sure. Okay. Thank you. The other um, thing I'll say on that, say on that as ahead. well is the selection of the points to measure is still done manually. Um, which again adds quite significant error. You know, there's without any snap to functions for virtual objects, and the same actually because when you're aiming at a point, you know, it's it's a lot of it's down to how accurately you can indicate the point that you wish to make two points you wish to measure between. Okay, that's great. Uh, from uh, anonymous attendee, question about uh, language: Can the language be changed? Uh, to, to, to native tongue of um, workers whose English isn't that great. Yeah, there is a, a support for, for different kind of languages already in the application that has been also mentioned in the chat box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so English, French, Dutch, German, Norwegian, Swedish, Portuguese and Chinese, just in case anyone can't see that. Um, I think this picks up again on, on that same point. When you orientate the devices by moving between two points, how do you select the points you move between? Yeah, it all comes from the application itself. So the application, uh, it guides you and it's quite a straightforward workflow. So basically first you pick a point within the model with your fingers, then you just place the, uh, the kit at the corresponding location in the physical world. And you do the same process with uh, the second points and then the and kind of an automated placement will, will be undertaken. Okay. Um, from Adrian again, for all of the site QA tools, irrespective of type, key is planning out the required checks as part of the ITP. As some of this seems very reactive. How can the tool be, tools be used to plan, report against required checks and show that all checks are complete, actions assigned and then closed out, etc.? I suppose Scott can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hi guys, Scott McGovern from Langer Rock. Um, Adrian's spot on, right? Um, it, actually, what we were, we were very keen to try and see how we could actually use the the various um, uh, tools within our workflows for for inspection. One of the key things we were looking at is actually how accurate can we place the hololens, um, uh, the hologram um, in, in as an overlay in in the real world. Um, and then once we did that, it then start to look at um, methods for improving the interaction with the, with the actual, the model. James meant, mentioned one about the ability to more accurately select a point in on the hologram itself, the virtual model against the, the real model to be able to, to measure um, uh, distances and check tolerances. Um, uh, some other functionality we were looking at is how can we, um, within the, the actual tool, 
uh, color up certain um, elements to be able to show that certain things have been inspected and others haven't. I think that it, um, I think we're a little bit of a way there still um, to be able to reliably use something in, in construction because there's that many different inspection and test plans that we've got and a lot of the software at the moment, although there's development kits to, to build the software on HoloLens, um, then you have to write it quite bespoke. Within manufacturing though, when you've got um, standard top operations that are happening, then then that's that's not out um, beyond the, the realm of, of, of man to be able to build a bespoke piece of software for a particular station or bay. And so I think that um, we're heading in the, in the right direction. On that. And, and particularly picking up Scott's point is, a lot of even if you get varying products coming through in the factory they tend to vary parametrically so you know you, you'd get the same style of cage like the one we saw in the video but with embedments moved to different coordinates or different rebars at different spacings so you know if you can lock, put a bit of middleware in there that knows the generic sequence to follow the ITP and basically gets past coordinate da uh, data so it, you know, it's, it can take account of the variation. You then also take out another source of quality issue, which is uh, concern, which is I've inspected the wrong thing because I was actually looking at the wrong definition because I had a, a paper drawing and a coordinate sheet and I misunderstood it and the image actually parametrically adapts to what I'm supposed to be inspecting. It, the other interesting thing about it is that at the moment, a lot of the processes for um, inspection are aligned to a kind of old school, old school methods for handing over um, a quality record. So it's a, typically it's something like a marked up drawing or a, or a checklist that you will check that you've done certain checks and, and tick a box and then sign it off at the end. This doesn't necessarily easily flow into a, an augmented reality headset. So we need to actually start to define what these actual records will be um, that we can actually utilize and that will be sufficient to give people confidence that the appropriate inspections have been undertaken correctly. So it's, it's, it's evolving space, but, but we're getting there. It's good. Okay. A uh, question from Eric Cordiner. Uh, uh, how do you manage and store all the critical captured data? Uh, the way to do that currently through the systems is by capturing to-dos. We saw in various examples, either with Sight Vision or with uh, the HoloLens device. But I, I think that is also related to the previous answer that Scott and James gave as well. Yeah, and, um, I mean, when I was using trialing both Sight Vision devices, um, images I would uh, use a standard to-do because it just takes, when you do a to-do, it takes the image in front of it. Um, the recorded dimensional data goes to um, a comma separated variable file. Um, so basically every time I measure a point or a dimension ever, it goes into this incrementally added to this file that's got more data than you ever know what to do with. Um, so it's not just a little bit you see on the screen. And with the HoloLens, sometimes I did it through to-dos and for videos, it was easy just to use the basic HoloLens video capture uh, functionality. This is another okay. point. With both devices, we basically use Android phones and the HoloLens, which is Windows 10, so you can add whatever applications you want as well, and you can interact with those two as well for reporting. So you can save videos, you can save images, and these are saved uh, the hardware devices as well. Okay, all right. A uh, question from David Robinson. If GPS location is not accurate enough to achieve millimeter accuracy requirements of rebar, would it be technically possible to adapt HoloLens, et cetera, to use local GPS systems that use a network of laser scanners to accurately geolocate the visualization device in real space? Ted, do you want to answer this or shall I answer it? Everything is possible. It's, it's, it's about sitting down and, and doing it when it comes to these things. Uh, that that's the, the the challenge with the laser scanner is it's producing an awful lot of data that also has to be processed, uh, registered, and, and and cleaned before you can do very much of it. And that adds on to another aspect of it. A total station in that end is probably easier, as it's cleaner to work with. But it, it's not it's not an impossible possibility to do these kind of things. That's uh, but it's a process that has to sit down and go through. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and there's, there's a couple of open ones and then we'll, 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 we'll move towards wrapping up. Uh, Dan O'Gorman asks, is it imperative to use QR codes for establishing the location? 
Um, imperative, no, but uh, I think with the rebar uh, cages case, we saw that it, it's a little bit easier. Yeah. Uh, I have to say on the Holland ends, the nice thing, the reason they've gone down the QR code route is, it probably didn't come out clearly out of the video, is when it's looking for a location, I just have to go and face it, and in about half a second, it registers the QR code, the date and point on it, and bang, you're done. You know, that's, that's the reason they used is they work really well with a HoloLens. But as we mentioned, there are different ways that you can uh, basically align your data. It's just an additional way if that fits in your workflow, basically. Okay. Uh, anonymous attendee asks, how easy is the hand manipulation to use with the HoloLens Trimble? Um, as I said, the, the issue was actually getting hold of things. Um, once I've found a nice flat surface, so I cheated and put that big red plate on the top. Well, actually, Steve, Steve from Trimble did it for me. I should give him the credit. Yeah. And then I could grab that. It was very far. It was very easy. Um, but the rebar in particular, as I said, is it's because they're a very narrow um, cylinder. Um, the hollow lens couldn't detect that my, my finger ray beam coming out of my finger had actually hit it. Um, and even when I tried it on some of the larger uh, embedments, there's some plastic ones that like sort of, uh, uh, in the, like an extruded, um, they've got flat and round surfaces. Sometimes it picked up the flat surface, sometimes I'd missed and it pick up a side surface and I'd attach at an angle. So it, it's once you can get it selected on what you want, it's fine. It was actually getting hold of the right object in the right place was was difficult. Okay, all right. Um, we've got two more questions, then, then, then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, David asking, I wonder if Langer Rock have attempted to use these technologies in its overseas markets yet, and if so, how is it going? James, that'll be one for you or possibly I'm Scott. just thinking, actually, Scott, you're, I'm not aware of anything. Are you aware of anything in Australia? Um, uh, to be honest, yeah. when I was doing my uh, bids here on Mixed Reality, I was contacted by a language mm -hmm. from Australia so, in order to, to do that. So maybe yeah. it's something that they're exploring. Yeah, we have we have been. Sorry, I was just trying to unmute myself and I didn't realise I was already unmuted. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah, we have. We actually, over in Australia, um, when I've uh, been, been keen in looking into um, AR and VR for, for quite a while, um, when the, um, uh, whole, uh, what do you call it, the Oculus Rift was first out in the, as a, um, a thing on Kickstarter, we followed it on Kickstarter and um, and got some devices in and started playing around with with utilising um, Oculus. And we, when Hololens came on board, we got Hololens devices as well over in Australia. We've we've got the similar sort of challenges around it. A lot of the applications we're using in the first instance um, are around putting a headset on for bid presentations and to uh, allow people to visualise a 3D model, say, on a boardroom. Um, instead of having what might be um, a, an architectural model that, that like a physical model that you can have a, a, a digital model and then interact with the digital model in that way you don't have the same problems around um, uh, around measuring it and for tolerance and so forth but it's, it does in, in that aspect although it's incredibly impressive it doesn't add the value to to where we could see the real value could be out or out on site and hence why we fired up this project to uh, to see see what where we could where we could utilize it within our manufacturing and and on-site activities that's great scott thank you very much um i think we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll end there uh, as we we've uh, we've gone well past uh, our allotted time so i would like to thank uh, mariana james and indeed scott for jumping in as well um for their uh, presentations and answering your questions should you wish to listen to the webinar again or you want to share it with colleagues, you can do so by following the original registration link later this afternoon. Uh, our series of webinars cont uh, continues and indeed concludes at 2 p.m. this afternoon with input from Offset as we focus on laser scanning for as-built verification of in situ concrete embeds. There's still time to register for that webinar. You can use the bit.ly link now on screen. So that's bit dot ly slash dce 
05 bit.ly slash dce05 thank you very much again to all our speakers thank you to you the audience for tuning in i hope you'll join us at 2 p.m good afternoon <laughs>